Ah, the Visionaire cipher. The fancy cipher that makes all those basic monoalphabetic ciphers just look silly. Invented by a French diplomat and cryptographer named Blaise de Visionaire way back in the 16th century before social media and even Netflix. This cipher was like the holy grail of encryption back in the time. One might say it was almost visionary. The Visionaire cipher is a, like a sneaky little puzzle mastermind. It uses multiple alphabets to encrypt a message, and each letter is shifted a certain number of places on a secret keyword. The keyword is repeated over and over again until it matches the length of the message being encrypted, like a secret code word between friends. Unlike earlier ciphers, the Visionaire cipher was a tough nut to crack, even for the brightest minds of the day. The cipher was used for military and diplomatic communications during the Renaissance period and remained unbreakable for over 300 years until a British cryptographer named Charles Babbage finally cracked it in the mid-19th century. One of the interesting things about the Visionaire cipher is that it was actually used by the Confederacy during the American Civil War but was later cracked by Union cryptographers using frequency analysis. Oops. Despite its age, the Visionaire cipher still holds a special place in the hearts of cryptographers everywhere. In fact, its principles are still used in modern encryption methods like RSA and AES. Not too shabby for a cipher that's older than the United States. Next, we have the Playfair cipher, which is a bit of play on words in the face of game theory analysts. The Playfair cipher is a polygraphic substitution cipher, which means that it replaces pairs of letters rather than individual letters. It was named after its creator's friend, Baron Playfair, who was the British ambassador to Russia at the time. The Playfair cipher works by using a 5x5 grid of letters, where each letter of the alphabet is used once and one letter is omitted. The letters of the key phrase are then used to fill in the remaining spaces on the grid. So, to encrypt the message, the plain text is divided into pairs of letters, and each is then mapped onto the grid. If both letters are in the same row or column of the grid, they are replaced by the letters to their right or below, respectively. If the letters are not in the same row or column, they are replaced by the letters at the opposite corners of the rectangle formed by their positions. So the Playfair method was widely used during World War I and World War II by the British and American militaries, and it remained unbreakable for many years. However, as with all encryption methods, it became vulnerable to more sophisticated attacks, and it was largely replaced by other encryption methods. The Playfair cipher has also been featured in popular culture, including the novel The Da Vinci Code and the TV series Sherlock. Fast forward to 1882, where the one-time pad was first invented by an American inventor and telegraph operator, Frank Miller. It works by using a random and secret key that is only used once, hence the name one-time pad. To encrypt a message using the one-time pad, each letter of the plain text is combined with a letter from the key using modular addition, where each letter is assigned a number according to its position on the alphabet. A equals zero, B equals one, C equals two, I think you get it. The resulting number is then converted back into a letter. The key used in the one-time pad must be random and at least as long as the plain text being encrypted. The key can only be used once and must be kept completely secret from anyone who might be trying to intercept or decode the message, obviously. The one-time pad is considered to be unbreakable because there is no mathematical relationship between the plain text and the key and each key is only used once. And when I say unbreakable, I don't really mean unbreakable. It just means that people have said it might be unbreakable. This means that even if someone intercepts the ciphertext, they cannot use frequency analysis or any other technique to decipher the original message. The one-time pad was used extensively during World War II by both allies and Axis powers, and it remains a popular encryption method among intelligence agencies and military organizations today. However, the one-time pad is not without its drawbacks. It requires a truly random key that is at least as long as the plain text, which can be difficult to generate and transmit securely. Additionally, if the key is compromised in any way, the entire system is compromised, which makes the one-time pad vulnerable to a variety of attacks. Oh, and there is also that one little thing that if you're actually able to sneak your net the key over to the receiving party so that they would be able to decrypt your message, you might have just wanted to send the message by itself instead. The Hill Cipher was invented in 1929 by Lester S. Hill, an American mathematician who was interested in developing a more secure encryption method than those that were currently in use. The Hill cipher works by using linear algebra to transform blocks of letters into ciphertext. Unlike other encryption methods that use substitution or transposition to scramble letters, the Hill cipher uses matrix multiplication to perform the encryption. 
No, not that matrix. To encrypt the message using the Hill cipher, the plain text is first divided into blocks of n number of letters, where n is the size of the key matrix. The key matrix is a square matrix that is randomly generated by the sender and is kept secret. The plain text blocks are then multiplied by the key matrix using arithmetic, where each letter is assigned a numerical value according to its position in the alphabet. A equals zero, B equals one, C equals two, and so on. The resulting values are then converted back into letters to form the ciphertext. The Hill cipher was considered to be very secure because the key matrix must be known in order to decrypt the message. And it's very difficult to determine the matrix from the ciphertext alone. However, the Hill cipher has some limitations. It's vulnerable to attacks if the key matrix is not truly random or if it's too small. Additionally, if the key size is not carefully chosen, the encryption process can be very slow and cumbersome. Despite these limitations, the Hill cipher was an important step forward in the world of cryptography and helped pave the way for more advanced encryption methods, again, such as AES and other types. The next chapter of our story takes us forward to the beginning of World War II, a time of intrigue, ingenuity, secrets, and their keepers. In the depths of history's veil, Germany is beginning to build an army that will shock the world. The beginning of Operation Anschluss starting with the annexation of Austria. Annexation, of course, being a fancy word for gathering lots of your buddies, grabbing a lot of guns, crossing the border, and taking what doesn't belong to you, Viking style. This was, of course, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, created ironically to hold those accountable for World War I and to prevent exactly the series of events that was about to take place next. And so our story begins here. Our protagonist, or antagonist, to be honest, I'm not really sure which one he is, would be none other than Arthur Scherbius, a German engineer with obvious trust issues. As legend has it, he once declared, the only way to break my Enigma code is for someone to marry my sister and start a family tradition of decoding messages. Fueled by a burning desire to outhit his adversaries and to draw attention away from his questionable sense of humor, Scherbius set out on a quest to create an encryption method that would render existing techniques completely obsolete and to bring glory to himself and Germany. And thus the Enigma machine emerged from Sherbius' devious yet ingenious mind. Driven by rotors, these mischievous gears hummed along and spun along, completely oblivious to the way that they were shaping the world. So let us picture this scene. A fleet of German U-boats, all armed with Enigma machines, communicating wirelessly to naval commanders in Germany by encrypted messages. The blueprints of military operations, troop movements, naval strategies, intelligence reports, and even the coordinates of secret rendezvous. Messages, like the whispers in a cold night, traveled across vast distances, teasing their enemies with riddles of ciphertext. The Enigma machine was their cryptic guardian, their path to success as they plotted their next moves on the chessboard of war. But what was this Enigma machine? Let us find out. First off, we have the rotors. The heart of the Enigma machine resided in its rotors, which were the core components responsible for the encryption process. These rotors consisted of a series of physically complex interconnected electrical contacts and wiring. Second, each rotor contained a unique arrangement of wiring connections, further creating a complex network that would determine the letter substitution process. The wiring design ensured that each keystroke produced a different encryption result, adding yet another layer of cryptographic security. Third, the reflector. The Enigma machine featured a reflector which added an additional layer of complexity to the encryption process. This component ensured that the electrical pathway between the input and output of the machine was non-reciprocal, increasing the complexity yet even more. Fourth, the plugboard. Another fascinating element of the Enigma machine was the plugboard, also known as the Steckerbrett. The plugboard allowed users to manually swap pairs of letters, further enhancing the encryption capabilities even more, introducing yet more complexity into the ciphertext. Fifth, two keyboards. The operator would press a key on the input keyboard and the corresponding encrypted letter would illuminate on the output keyboard, making it easy to transmit the encoded messages back and forth. The first keyboard was for the input, the second was for the output. And additionally, and finally, a compact design. The Enigma machine was designed to be portable, allowing for its use in various military settings. Its compact size and sturdy construction made it suitable for field operations on the front line or wherever soldiers may be. And so the German military machine began using the Enigma machine for secure communication and encryption of their military strategies. The fate of the war may very well depend on the ability of the Allied forces to be able to decipher these messages. But how would they do this? Meanwhile, fate had yet more unlikely surprises in store. 
a hero in the form of Alan Turing, with a lean frame of bespeckled glaze, thin-rimmed glasses. Turing hinted at an intensity that yet he only understood, but was often ridiculed by his peers. However, behind those piercing eyes lay a mind that itself operated like a tuned machine, analyzing and deciphering complex problems with remarkable precision for a human. Of course, he was brilliantly British, but he was also a noted mathematician and scientist. With a reluctant team of other brilliant minds by his side, Turing was tasked with defeating the most enigmatic of machines, a daunting task for any data scientist at the time. And so we must pause here. But yet, be not perturbed, for as in episode 3, we'll be moving on to discuss the bomb, or Bombay, or Beyonce. To be honest, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that either. However, it was a machine cleverly built by Alan Turing and his team of cryptologists. Until then, guard that crypto for peace of mind in the digital grind. Strike out. 